Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Gäste, im Namen der Körber Stiftung begrüße ich Sie ganz herzlich zu unserer heutigen Europe at Debate Veranstaltung im Körber Forum. Mein Name ist Gabriele Voidelko und ich bin hier im Haus in der Körber Stiftung zuständig für unsere europäischen Bildungs- und Verständigungsprojekte. 2015 ist nach dem großen Gedenkstrom des Jahres 2014, an dem wir Land auf, Land ab an den 100. Jahrestag des Ausbruchs des Ersten Weltkriegs erinnert haben, erneut ein europäisches Gedenkjahr. Seit Anfang des Jahres gab es zahlreiche Zeremonien, Gedenkstunden, Feierlichkeiten, Kranzniederlegungen, Museumseröffnungen, Denkmaleinweihungen, was auch immer, mit denen wir an den 70. Jahrestag des Kriegsendes erinnert haben. Des Zweiten Weltkriegs. Der Mai 1945 gilt als Umbruch, als Neuanfang, als Befreiung, wenigstens im westlichen Teil Europas, denn im östlichen Teil Europas hat es dann noch bis 1989 gedauert, bis äh, freiheitliche und demokratische Gesellschaften sich etablieren konnten. Also Frieden, wenn wir über Frieden reden und über Friedensprozesse, dann gilt es zu konstatieren, Frieden ist mehr als nur die Abwesenheit von Krieg. Und in diesem Sinne lohnt es sich, etwas genauer hinzusehen, wie ich finde. Der Zweite Weltkrieg, ausgelöst im nationalsozialistischen Deutschland oder vom nationalsozialistischen Deutschland, brachte 60 Millionen Kriegstote, führte zu immensen Bevölkerungsverschiebungen, zu ähm, Millionen von Kriegsgefangenen, zu Zerstörungen, zu all diesen Dingen, über die wir in, letzt, in den letzten Wochen und Monaten viel gehört und gelesen haben. Aber der Krieg hinterließ auch Spuren in den Seelen der Überlebenden und vor allen Dingen in den Seelen und Biografien derjenigen, die den Krieg erlebt haben, als sie Kinder und Jugendliche waren. Um Kriegskinder und um die Frage, welche Folgen Krieg für junge Menschen, für Kinder und Jugendliche hat, geht es in diesem Jahr uns in unserer Arbeit, in den Bildungs- und Dialogprojekten, in diesem Gedenkjahr 2015. Das ist der Schwerpunkt, dem wir uns widmen. Um die Wechselwirkungen zwischen Krieg und Menschen geht es auch heute Abend. Allerdings nicht um das Erbe des Zweiten Weltkriegs, sondern um einen Krieg, der vor genau 20 Jahren mit dem Abkommen von Dayton zu Ende ging. Ein Krieg, der trotz des Gründungsgedankens der Europäischen Union als Friedensprojekt und trotz der Überwindung der europäischen Teilung im Jahre 89 mitten in Europa ausbrach und dem die Europäische Union sehr wenig entgegensetzen konnte. Die Erinnerungen an diesen Krieg sind bei denjenigen, die ihn erlebt haben, immer noch sehr frisch. Und wer von Ihnen allen, von Ihnen, die Sie heute Abend hier sind, schon mal auf dem westlichen Balkan unterwegs war, der weiß, dass es neben den Spuren, die der Krieg im Leben der Menschen und in der Region selbst hinterlassen hat, auch zahlreiche äußerliche Folgeerscheinungen gibt. Damit meine ich nicht die teilweise noch sichtbaren Einschusslöcher in den Fassaden der Häuser, sondern auch und vor allem ethnische Teilungen in einer sehr multiethnischen und vielsprachigen Region. Ich meine die teilweise fragilen Staatengebilde und ich meine jede Menge sichtbare und unsichtbare Grenzen, die in dieser Region entstanden sind als Konsequenz des Krieges. Eins dieser komplizierten Staatengebilde, von dem ich eben gesprochen habe, ist durch den durch das Friedensabkommen von Dayton entstanden, das ist Bosnien-Herzegowina. Ein Land, in dem viele Menschen, vor allen Dingen junge Menschen, heute um eine Zukunftsperspektive kämpfen. Ich weiß nicht, ob Sie die Zahlen kennen, aber Bosnien-Herzegowina hat eine Jugendarbeitslosigkeit von mehr als 60 Prozent. Das ist mehr 
oder ähnlich viel, ähnlich beunruhigend wie die Zahlen, die wir aus Griechenland, Italien und anderen südlichen europäischen Ländern kennen. Heute Abend wollen wir gemeinsam mit Ihnen und mit unseren Gesprächspartnern auf der Bühne Bilder des Krieges aus Sarajevo in den Blick nehmen, die eben keine 100 Jahre alt sind, sondern nur etwas mehr als 20 Jahre alt. Wir wollen nach den Spuren des Krieges im Leben der Menschen fragen und wir wollen auch über Themen wie Verantwortung Europas für Frieden, Dialog und Versöhnung reden. Die schlechte Nachricht des Abends ist, dass einer unserer Gäste daran gewöhnt ist, in einer ganz eigenen Sprache zu sprechen, für die es keine Übersetzung gibt. Die gute Nachricht des Abends ist, dass unser Gast diese Sprache so gut beherrscht, dass er eigentlich gar keine Übersetzung braucht. Die Rede ist, Sie ahnen es sicherlich bereits, von dem preisgekrönten und international hoch anerkannten Fotografen Tom Stoddard, der mit seinen Schwarz-Weiß-Aufnahmen, überwiegend Schwarz-Weiß-Aufnahmen aus den Kriegs- und Krisengebieten dieser Welt Fotogeschichte geschrieben hat. Lieber Tom Stoddard, wir freuen uns sehr, dass Sie heute Abend bei uns sind und dass wir einige Ihrer Bilder sehen dürfen, die Sie während der Belagerung von Sarajevo in der Stadt, von der Stadt und ihren Menschen gemacht haben. Herzlich willkommen in Hamburg. Im Anschluss an die Bildpräsentation oder wenn Sie so mögen an Ihren Bildvortrag wollen wir über die Folgen des Krieges ins Gespräch kommen. Dazu haben wir neben Ihnen, Herr Stoddard, den in Mostar geborenen jungen Bosnier Adnan Rahimic eingeladen, den wir in der Körperstiftung im Rahmen unseres Projekts Future Lab Europe, das wir gemeinsam mit zehn anderen europäischen Stiftungen durchführen, vor vier Jahren kennenlernen durften. Adnan selbst ein Kriegskind, er wird Ihnen heute davon erzählen, koordiniert heute an der Universität Sarajevo europäische Bildungs- oder Austauschprogramme für Studenten, also ein Botschafter des Dialogs, wenn man so will. Lieber Adnan, vielen, vielen Dank, dass Sie hergekommen sind aus Sarajevo zu uns und dass Sie uns Ihre Geschichte erzählen wollen. Genau. So, und damit wir zwischen all diesem Vergangenheit, Gegenwart und Zukunft von Krieg und Frieden in Sarajevo, auf dem Balkan und im restlichen Europa nicht vollkommen die Orientierung verlieren, haben wir den langjährigen Leiter des Auslandsressorts des Stern und den heutigen Editor at Large, Hans-Hermann Klare, darum gebeten, uns als Fährmann durch die durch das schwierige Fahrwasser dieses Gesprächs zu führen. Auch an Sie, Herr Klare, vielen Dank, dass Sie bei uns sind. Lassen Sie mich schließen mit den üblichen Wünschen. Ich wünsche Ihnen und uns allen einen anregenden und einen, einen anregenden Abend und einen Abend mit nachhaltigen Eindrücken mit viel Gelegenheit zum Nach- und Weiterdenken. Hätten wir uns vor anderthalb Jahren hier getroffen, dann hätte ich am Schluss meiner Begrüßung der Hoffnung Ausdruck gegeben, dass Europa in der zweiten Dekade des 21. Jahrhunderts nun doch hoffentlich endlich beim Frieden angekommen ist. Leider haben die Ereignisse in der Ukraine oder der Krieg in der Ukraine uns eines Besseren belehrt. Insofern ist das, worüber wir heute sprechen, keine Geschichte, sondern es ist Gegenwart, nicht nur für die Menschen auf dem Balkan, sondern heute auch in der Ukraine. Vielen Dank und jetzt, Tom Stoddard, bitte ich Sie auf die Bühne, damit wir uns Ihre Bilder anschauen können. Vielen Dank. Good evening. Thank you very much for uh, coming tonight. And uh, thank you to the Corba Forum for inviting me to show my work from Sarajevo, the Siege of Sarajevo. 
Um, I've been a photographer a very long time, 44 years. I know it doesn't look, I don't look old enough, but I have been taking pictures for that long. And Sarajevo was the time when it, it, it meant more to me than any other assignment that I've, I've covered. Um, I don't have a lot of time, but uh, I'll show you some pictures and talk briefly about um, what I found there. I went to Sarajevo in July 1992, and um, I was amazed how close it was to London. That was the first thing that, um, the first impression I got. And I started to uh, work, and I spent pretty much four years there, going back and forward to London. At that time, I was working for Life magazine, Time magazine, Sunday Times. So I would go in, spend six weeks, shoot my pictures, shoot my story, and then go back to London. This is before digital, obviously. So, um, as I say, we'll just go through some of the pictures, and I'll tell you some of the stories, and uh, give you my impressions of what I found there as a, as a photojournalist. And then, of course... We'll hear what uh, Adnan uh, has to say about his impressions from the other side and, and, and the situation there today. So we've all probably heard of Sniper Alley. Um, it uh, was the place where people... Imagine going to work, running for your life across the street outside. And in that city at the time, uh, you didn't need artillery and uh, mortars... It was the snipers that created the fear. If you imagine going to work every morning and you think that uh, you're going to become victim uh, of, a, of a, a sniper 500 meters away, then you deal with it in different ways. Some of the people uh, got to the uh, section here and ran. You'll see the women are wearing flat shoes. Um, very quickly you adapt to uh, the situation. I had a lot of time for women. In, in all the stories that I've done over the years, um, I found that women make the best subjects. They, um, they always feed themselves last, their families first. They always uh, provide. Uh, they're the ones who go out and look for the water and look for the bread. That's why so many people, uh, so many women died in this particular conflict. Uh, they called this being on the carriage diet. Most women lost about 20 kilos uh, during the uh, conflict. And uh, it was because they were running everywhere and they, they were out searching for food and bread and, and water and, and trying to grow things. So I became amazingly close to uh, this situation because of the, the sheer um, dignity that I saw and the sheer courage that I saw uh, portrayed by uh, these people in such a difficult situation. In all, in all my work, no matter how bad the situation, I always try and uh, bring back pictures that are uplifting. I mean, in any, in any war, in any famine, in any earthquake, you will see human beings uh, struggling to survive, but you'll also see amazing uh, acts of love and tenderness, You'll see children like this uh, running, and her mother is running behind her, just saying, go, go, go. And then she sees the camera, and you, you, know, you get this split second of normality in this, what is a hellish situation. Just for the technically minded, I, I don't talk about cameras very much, but um, I use Leica cameras, German cameras. I don't use telephotos. Um, I work very close to people, and 90% of my work is in black and white. So here we are at the beginning of the siege with people trying to find their way through alleyways and to escape the, the never-ending presence of the, of, um, of the gunman. Here's a, a moment that, I, as I was speaking about earlier, tenderness, even though this is in a very dangerous area. This soldier, who obviously is a target, has taken time to help the old man cross the, uh, the square. And 
It's, these are the kind of pictures that I love to shoot. I, don't, I hate working with military uh, or soldiers or whatever. It's the, it's the costs of, of, of the situation. How do ordinary people like all of us here deal with it? I always think, what would it be like if, if something like this was happening in my own town? How would my brothers and sisters and family deal with it? And I'm looking for images that show uh, how real people deal with the situation. I'll stop and talk about four or five images as we go. This is one um, that has been used a lot around the world. And what's happening here is the lady is in a line of people waiting to evacuate her child onto a, onto a bus. Just as our, our mothers and grandmothers did in uh, London during the, uh, the bombing in World War II and Berlin, um, the children were sent to the countryside to make them safe. So I don't have children, but if I did and I was in this situation, I would dress him in the, his best clothes and I would try and be brave. And when I captured this moment, uh, that's what I thought was happening. So for many years, this picture was being used um, with the caption that the woman was putting her child on the bus. And only a few years ago, I got an email from someone in Australia who said... I know this lady, she's my neighbor. So I went to Perth in Australia and I met her. Her name is Gordana and her son is called Andre. And what I didn't know was that she had uh, maneuvered her way onto the bus and also left with him. She spent four years working in Italy before the two of them were um, allowed into Australia as refugees. Andre is now six foot two, he's about up here, um, a karate champion. Gordana is still very beautiful, she still has beautiful eyes. And when we met, she made it very clear that, you know, she doesn't like the picture. She understands why magazines have, have used it, but uh, for her, showing the tear, showing her... Um, in her eyes, it was a weakness, she didn't want to cry, she didn't want me to capture that. So we had a two or three day uh, uh, friendly meeting, but uh, she doesn't like the image, and, but she understands why it's, it's used a lot. I spend a lot of time photographing the children. I'm here these, uh, during the breaks in the shelling. These kids are playing um, Serbs and Bosnians instead of cowboys and Indians, and they're using the ammunition uh, cases and some of them here, as you can see, are pretending to be cameramen. And things that are in their head are all around them. At the beginning of the siege, I mean, it lasted 47 months. It was the longest siege since the Second World War. Uh, when I first arrived there, there were scenes like this, where young men and teenagers were flirting and... Um, you know, it was quite a cool thing to have your, uh, your machine gun over your shoulder. And at this time, the, the people were saying to us journalists, um, you know, how long will this go on? And we were quite confident. We said, don't worry, you know, the European leaders and the politicians won't let this go on for very long. But over the years, it became much harder. They realized um, that no one was going to come and help them. America was telling uh, the European leaders, it's your, it's your turn to sort things out. So the people started to... There wasn't so many scenes like this. This is the financial district of um, Sarajevo. And again, during the, uh, the lull in the fighting, the kids would be out in the, in the street. This is only two days after I arrived there, and this is when I realized that I was looking at something very unusual. Uh, when I started to see these ladies collecting uh, leaves from the roadside to make soup, I was working in the marketplace and I would see them with uh, pearls, uh, arguing about the price of, um, of leaves and off the trees and um, from the ground. And that's when I realized that this was, you know, so close to, to London, to Paris, um, so close to all of us, and these people were struggling, really struggling. 
This is the Kosovo hospital. This is me. Um, I just put this in because, just to tell one story, I was working there and I was badly injured um, during a, a, a mortar attack. During fighting, I was working near the Bosnian parliament. And in the morning, I, I was photographing at the hospital. And there was a man there. He was about six foot eight. And his job was to reach into a car and pull out the, the wounded. And I'd been photographing him in the morning. And I was running. And then suddenly, I was on the ground. I was wearing a flat jacket, so I couldn't move. My shoulder was completely smashed. My leg was completely smashed. And I was lying there, and there was a lot of shooting. And along the ground, this guy came who I've never met or, or seen since. And he pulled me to safety. And then they loaded me into a car. And the next thing I remember was I was looking up at this same guy that I was photographing in that morning. And he's looking down at me. I'm unconscious. And he picked me up and just put me on the, um, on the, in, at the trauma department. So three days later, there was no electricity. People were dying. People were being wounded. Three days later, um, there was still, we still couldn't get any x-rays. There was no electricity. And the electricity went on in the hospital. And there was a line of wounded all the way down the corridor. And these people said, no, no, we have to put the foreigner first. He must go first for the x-ray. And something that stayed with me all my life, you know, they, these people had were going through hell, and yet they wanted me to have a very valuable x-ray to, to find out what my injuries were. So that's always stuck with me, and it's the only reason I put this in. I don't know why I'm smiling, by the way. For those of you who know Sarajevo, this is um, the Lion uh, Park, Lion Cemetery. It used to be a place before 1992 where lovers would walk and walk the, people would walk their dogs, and you can see the dates on the, on the crosses. Uh, very quickly, it became a place where um, people were buried. A lot of them were buried at night to avoid the, the sniping and the mortar shells. And I spent a lot of time there working um, in this area. Some of you may recognize this guy, he, um, Vedran, who, who used to perform in various places in, um, in Sarajevo. This is a place called Hero Square. It was right on the front line in, um, in the area. And you know, people were, they had to run for their life virtually all the time, on both sides, not just one side. Um, and I spent time there whenever I could. This is my room at the Holiday Inn. Um, I was only there a little while, but it used to make me smile because um, the Holiday Inn was in a very dangerous area and the, the staff were great. They, they always came and, and tidied the room and everything. And it made me smile because they always used to put one of those things around the toilet, you know, sanitized for your protection. And there was no water, there was nothing there, but they still just wanted to um, reassure us that it, it was okay. So these are just pictures that I, shoot, I shot walking around the streets. It's, it's how I like to work. I mean, you make... You make pictures with your head and your heart and your feet, basically, just going out and walking the streets. Uh, this mannequin was uh, something that every day it was, it was put up and then it would be shot down and then put up again and shot down. I'm proud of this picture because it was a cover picture in Newsweek and... These magazines, as you probably know, they do their um, research and they work out how, what the sales are and, and how the week as issue has gone. And this was the worst selling issue uh, for months and months. So I was really proud of that because ne the, ne the week after, you know, they put Princess Diana back on the cover or whatever. So um, it was, it was um, 
to get a black and white picture on the cover of a magazine is, is tough. It's, it was tough then, it's virtually impossible now. So just to uh, let you know, a few, two years ago I went back to the city and I started to look for people that I photographed um, at, at the first time around. So this is um, Miramar and Smokey, who um, I found, one of the people I found, she um, is, is now works for a, a writing charity. She's got um, multiple sclerosis. And she remembers very well. Her big thing was dogs. She, she used to have a lot of dogs. And uh, I was in her life for maybe a second and then gone. So it was great to go back and, and find her and meet her and find out how she did and that she survived. I mean, you have to remember that children suffered greatly in this conflict. 10,600 people died. 56,000 were wounded in, in the uh, four years. Of that, 1,600 were children, 15,000 children were wounded. 40% um, of children had, had been shot at. These are UNICEF figures, they're not mine. Um, and they reckon 50% of children had um, witnessed someone being killed. This little boy couldn't speak. He, was, he lived on the front line and he couldn't speak at all. He lived in these houses. And um, it was, you know, shocking to see the shock, in a way. This is Sadiqa and Amra. Sadiqa um, lost her legs of the tank shell. And I went back to photograph them again two years ago. Amra um, is now studying law. She's going to be a human rights lawyer. And it was great to hear their story. So this is Meliha. She, um, I was making a story about women. And I saw her coming towards me. It, this is a place called Dobrynya, where it was a very dangerous area. And it was an area where the uh, apartments had been made for the athletes during the Olympics. And I was shooting pictures around, and I saw this vision coming towards me. Um, I made three frames, and then she was gone. And Life magazine wanted to run the pictures, so I didn't have any details. So they sent me back to find her. And it became clear that you know this, this was her war. This was her way of saying, you will never defeat me. Um, she... Uh, sold her food to get uh, makeup. She wanted to look good. That was the biggest thing in her life. And again, two years ago, I went back and we uh, met again. And I photographed her at the same place. She's still beautiful. And she still um, walks just exactly like that. From a photographer's point of view, this is a picture that it's been used many times. Um, because it, you're trying to capture something that... Without a caption, you're just trying to make an image that says um, pride, dignity, beauty. And the fact she looks like Sophia Loren helps as well. So it's been used many times, this, uh, this image. I've, been trying to, I've tried to pick pictures that showed you what was going on in the dark, you know, behind the scenes. People trying to keep their, their spirits up during this uh, incredibly long conflict. So there was things like makeup classes, fashion. Um, and here we are three, three years in, and look how these women are dressed. I love pictures that show the minutiae of what life is like. There's no water, remember. There's no electricity. And they look amazing. You know, they, they, they're so beautifully turned out. And again here, the uh, armored personnel carrier is going back and forward over Sniper Alley so that the people can shelter behind it. Um, but we're three years into this siege and they're still looking amazing. So this is um, Amala, the baby. I knocked on her door two years ago and this beautiful girl opened it and so I said, is that you? And she said, yes, that's me and that's my godfather. 
uh, who came to the hospital to pick me up before uh, he went back to the front line. And of course, she doesn't remember the war, but now uh, she's studying to be a journalist. Sadly, her godfather committed suicide. Um, yeah. During the shelling, we, you know, we used to share shelters, cellars, food, everything we could. And I, I can tell you that it's a privilege as a photographer to, you know, I've shot a lot of pictures of politicians and celebrities and, and people like that. And you know that you're being used all the time. They don't, they don't have you there because they love you. Um, they have you there because you can be useful to them. But in a situation like this, where there's shells falling all around you, um, it's an amazing thing to, to share such danger and to walk away and to go back and, and find out that they survived. This lady was a very poor um, family. She had a lot of children and we used to, myself and some other journalists, used to take her coffee and um, some food and, and whenever we could. And she got right through the siege, and then she went for a walk at the end, and, and sadly she, she stood on a mine. And this is uh, the result. The trees were all cut down, the branches were all used, and then they started to... Uh, you can see now how uh, emaciated these people are. Um, but they kept going. I knew they would survive. I knew they would keep going. A lot of the... Well, all of the open space was turned into gardens, but still the guy isn't doing any work on the balcony. <laughs> These ladies are digging for shell casings to sell, uh, to make money from the brass. And then normal life started to come back. Again, this is Sniper Alley, and um, we're near the end now, and there's a ceasefire. But it took a long time, and Adnan will tell you how long it took. It's still, there's still danger from mines. That's it. Is that 20 minutes or? <laughs> Do I need this one? Are you speaking English? Um, if it's all right, I'll start in, in German for a while, if that's all right. Sure. Okay, fine. Um, Tom, diese Bilder haben vielen von uns wahrscheinlich wieder nahegebracht, was wir schon weit vergessen zu haben schienen, nämlich wie vor, was vor 20 Jahren auf dem Balkan und in Sarajevo passiert ist. Und es wird uns, vielen werden uns die Bilder nahegegangen sein. Es erinnert uns zugleich an das, was wir im Augenblick aus der Ukraine sehen, aus Donetsk und Ähnliches. Was bedeuten die, für uns sind die Bilder inzwischen Teil des kollektiven Gedächtnisses geworden. Was bedeuten die Bilder für Sie 20 Jahre später? Was empfinden Sie, wenn Sie sie wiedersehen? Well, for me, they're incredibly personal. This is, this is only a snapshot of, you know, many photographs I have. Um, the thing about, so for, for me, they're very personal. Each moment I can remember exactly where I was, how I felt. Um, you know, I felt looking at the image. But the, the sad thing is, as you just said, it could be in Ukraine, it could be in Aleppo, it could be in so many other places around the world now. Um, it just happened to be, um, you know, in, in Bosnia. So I think the lessons are that um, it can happen anywhere. And... As I say, for me, they're incredibly personal. The, the, the people in them um, mean a lot to me because they, uh, they allowed me into their life. They allowed me to photograph them when they were burying their dead. Uh, and by the way, they wanted, they wanted photographs taken with, with all the journalists. They, we weren't 
just sticking a camera in their face. They, they thought that if they allowed us to work, um, that somehow the, you know, the siege would come to an end more quickly. So they are very personal pictures to me, and I, I appreciate uh, all the help that I was given. Sie haben ja Risiken auf sich genommen. Sie sind, wie wir gesehen haben, verletzt worden. War es den Aufwand wert? War es die Mühe und das Risiko wert, wenn Sie heute, 20 Jahre später, sich die Bilder anschauen? Absolut. Ich meine, du weißt, ich war glücklich. Wir haben beide Kollegen, die ihre Leben verloren haben. Wir haben jetzt Journalismus now is an incredibly risky business. I think the public sometimes forget the price that uh, brave correspondents, not me, but the people who do risk their lives, uh, local guys as well. There's a lot of the uh, areas in the world now, the magazines and newspapers and television, won't send their own correspondents. They have uh, local people who collect the information. And there are more journalists being killed now and photographers and cameramen and foreign correspondents than ever before. Um, it's incredibly important, I think, that journalism, uh, journalists keep going to these areas uh, and bring back the truth, because you can't rely on governments to tell you the truth. We all know that. Ich würde etwas zitieren, was Sie über Ihre Arbeit gesagt haben und Sie danach fragen. Manche Fotografen ziehen es vor, tiefer und tiefer in die Dunkelheit einzudringen. Sie haben die Suche nach der Menschlichkeit aufgegeben. Aber Momente von Menschlichkeit existieren in jedem Konflikt. Es bringt nichts, allein die dunkle Seite zu zeigen. Not at all. I mean, in these situations, people, they fall in love, they feed each other, they have sex, they get married, they look after their animals, they, uh, they have amazing kind of um, hope. Human being, I, I remember being in Beirut in 1982, and the place was absolutely like a moonscape. And thinking, this is never going to um, recover from this. And yet you go back years later and, you know, human beings have rebuilt and they've rebuilt their lives, rebuilt the buildings, rebuilt the economies, the businesses. Hopefully um, in Bosnia and Sarajevo and Mostar and all of those places, the same can happen um, as quickly as possible. Especially for the young generation like, the, like Adnan and the people he knows. Es gibt eben Fotografen, wie Sie sagen, die sich mehr auf das andere konzentrieren. Und es gibt eine größere Sensibilität heute in der Darstellung von Brutalität, als es sie vor vielen Jahren gegeben hat. Ist das das, was Sie unterscheidet von einer Reihe anderer? Nämlich genau der Versuch, der dann sogar zu Modefotografien oder dem, zum Benutzen der Fotografie in Modezeitschriften ge ähm, geführt hat. Nämlich das eine Bild dieser selbstbewussten an Sophia Leroyen erinnernden Frau, die im Angesicht von Gewehr und den, den Sandsäcken versucht, ihre Würde zu bewahren. Ist es das, was solche Bilder gut, positiv und vielleicht auch erträglich macht? Well, I mean, I, you've worked with great photographers all your, all your working life. You, I, I kind of take issue with the thing that um, photographers are, you know, just... Uh, ruthless and will do anything for a picture. Most of the, the very best people I've, I've seen are sensitive and, and they care about what they're doing. You know, you don't make money at this kind of thing. If you want to do, if you want to be rich, go and do royals or celebrities or fashion. Um, so you, you do have to care. And you start off being a war photographer when you're a kid, and then you very quickly become an anti-war photographer when you witness things in places like Gaza and, and other places. Um, so it's just how you, how you, where your career takes you. I mean, the camera is only a tool. It's just like a, write, a writer with a pen. Um, as a photojournalist, You want to make stories that are truthful. You want to bring pictures back that make people stop and think, maybe I should do something about this. Write to my politician, write, to, uh, give some money to an NGO, um, try and do something. I mean, you, photography doesn't by itself doesn't change anything. Collectively, we can all change something. Glauben Sie, dass so etwas zu fotografieren wie vor 20 Jahren in Sarajevo? dazu beigetragen hat, diesen langen Konflikt vielleicht ein bisschen abzukürzen? 
Ist es sinnvoll, nicht nur Leute zu informieren darüber, sondern hat es auch einen Effekt? Oder glauben Sie, dass ein solcher Krieg sich entwickelt, unabhängig davon, ob jemand wie Sie oder ein anderer da sind? 47 Monate wären es sonst mehr Jahre gewesen, wenn Sie nicht da gewesen wären und all die anderen? There is no doubt. Just, just think about, you know, things like, look, they can stop people like photographers like me, foreign correspondents, uh, governments and military can stop people going. They, they can, they can uh, hinder you at every point. But if you think about Abu Ghraib and, and those pictures, you know, um, those, they can't stop now pictures being shot on the inside by people who... Uh, carry cameras themselves and, and post them on social media. So it's right that, um, that photographers and photography um, is used, you know, taking the right pictures for the right reasons. Uh, it's never going to be wrong. It's always going to be better than not having journalists there because we know what happens when journalists are barred from, uh, from places where there is conflict and it, it, there's a long history of, of that. So I would always defend um, a photographer's right to be there. I mean, some of the areas we, I work in and you've worked in, if, you're not, if you don't believe that the pictures make a difference, then you shouldn't be there because this is not a game. It's not voyeurism. You're not a doctor. You're not a, a UN worker. So if you don't believe that your pictures make a difference, then you've got no business being there. Sie kennen sehr gut den britischen Fotografen Don McCullen, der ein bisschen älter ist als Sie, der jahrelang Krieg fotografiert hat und irgendwann sich dazu nicht mehr in der Lage sah und mindestens eine ganze Weile nichts anderes als Blumen mehr fotografiert hat, weil ihm das, was er fotografierte, zu nahe ging und das, was damit geschah, anschließend in den Medien auch nicht mehr passte. Können Sie das nachvollziehen? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, the people are human beings first and photographers second. Um talking about sensitive people. Uh, Don witnessed things along with people like Larry Burroughs who gave his life in Vietnam and, and the many other photographers who died there. Um, he witnessed things that we can't even imagine. And so everyone has a right to say enough. Um, and it, it's uh, to his credit that he did do that. Anders gefragt, wenn Sie Menschen in so schwierigen Situationen erleben und Sie haben das Recht, ja alle paar Wochen rauszufahren, die müssen da bleiben. Ist die Tatsache, dass die sich weiterhin ordentlich anziehen, dass sie weiter versuchen, einen Rest von Würde zu halten, ist das etwas, was auch für Sie als Fotograf oder für uns, was uns etwas erzählt, nämlich wie stark man sein kann, was Leute, ist es nicht eine beeindruckende Erfahrung, solche Leute zu erleben? Eine positive für sie selber möglicherweise, sogar trotz der Verletzung? Ja, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you look, you think you're having a bad day um, in our world, you know, and um, then you, you get to a situation like that. I mean, not just that. We, we were in Goma together, in Rwanda, places like that where... Um, famine in Sudan and, and, and awful situations like that. And, you know, you realize that your life is nothing compared to the despair that is going on in front of you. You know, that, it, that's a, another reason that we need to, and responsible magazines uh, like Stern and, and Time and, and the rest, we need to keep publishing these pictures to remind most people that, um, you know, a great deal of the world has no access to water, clean water or medicine or human rights or electricity. Um, we have to keep um, pushing to get space in these publications and on, on, and on television. Otherwise, we're just going to end up, you know, you know, it's just going to be a Disneyland and kind of yeah. royal family. Wir würden jetzt Adnan Rahimic gerne dazu bitten. Es gibt einen kleinen Film, den Adnan Rahimic produziert hat und den wir Ihnen gerne zeigen würden, sodass wir einen Eindruck bekommen von Adnan und dort, wo er herkommt, bevor er uns hier oben auf, der, auf dem Podium begleitet. Na, dazu kommt halt. Entschuldigung. Ja sam Adna, živim u Sarajevu, ali sam rođen u Mostaru. Kada kažete da ste iz Mostara, 
svaki Mostarac doda epitete da je upravo ovaj grad najljepši sa simboličnim starim mostom, uvijek sunčanim danima i najljubaznim ljudima. Kroz posao upoznao sam se sa mnogim organizacijama, između ostalog i Korbjel Stiftung organizaciju, jednom od osnivača Future Lab projekta. Kroz taj projekat upoznao sam mlade ljude iz Evrope i razmijenio mišljenja o raštim temama sa kojima se susrećemo, kao što su politika, ekonomija, društvo, terorizam, ratovi itd. Samim pominjanjem imena moje zemlje vezuje se za rat, te sam imao priliku da nekoliko puta dam svoje mišljenje i vidjenje rata u Bosni i Hercegovini, najčešće kroz vlastita iskustva. Sarajevo je uvijek bilo grad kultura, grad koji spaja istok i zapad. Ova zemlja je uvijek bila otvorena za sve one koji su morali bježati pred režimom koji im nije dopuštao slobodu mišljenja i načina života. Zbog toga je ova zemlja bogata raštim religijama i običajima. Četiri glavne i još mnoge druge religije čine ovaj grad Evropskim Jeruzalemom. Međutim, In order to survive, city had to pay a price. Opkoljeno Sarajevo postalo je slobodno zahvaljujući ljudima koji su branili ovaj grad. Nažalost, mnogi od njih su dali živote za slobodu ovog grada. Mnogo civila, među njima i djece, izgubilo je pravo da dožive mladost i starost. Po gradu se nalaze spomenici kao opomena da se ne zaboravi, da se ne ponovi. No, da li drugi uče iz naši lekcija? Um das Gespräch für uns etwas leichter zu machen, gestatten Sie mir bitte, dass wir uns jetzt zu dritt es in Englisch fortsetzen. Um, Adnan, you've shown it in your video and you've seen the pictures of, of what happened 20 years ago. You've seen the photographs of Tom. You were a child then. What, what do you see? What do you feel? What memories come back when you see these things? Uh, basically, The pictures that uh, uh, Tom took uh, were in Sarajevo, but as we talked uh, before, uh, this, these pictures can be easily uh, placed for Mostar, for Tuzla, for Banja Luka, for other cities uh, in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. What happened in Sarajevo happened also in, in Mostar, where I was during the war. Uh, probably, if I was a 10-year boy and looking at these pictures, same thing as I looked pictures from the Second World War, I wouldn't feel that connection. I would understand that it is something serious, very hard time, but uh, knowing that I survived this, knowing that uh, I was part of, of that makes it emotional. Uh, when, when I did uh, this video, I... Uh, I probably watched it like a uh, hundred times to, to, to make each song and each word correct. But uh, when I watched from there, it, uh, it was really emotional. So probably uh, you have to be there to, to know the feeling, to know what, what, what happened uh, re really. We can tell stories and stories about the war, but uh, 
I'm not inviting you to, to be in, in the war, of course, but uh, it's, a, it's a different feeling and we can try to explain, but you can't uh, un understand 100% as the people who, who were there. As you've told me earlier, you've been separated from your family for a while and, and luckily at some point it, it ended. You were a refugee in your own country, so to speak. Maybe you want to tell the people a little about Yes, what I was. was. Um, I, I mean, there are so many stories, uh, uh, different fates and, and di different uh, ways of, of sur surviving. Uh, I was... Uh, when the war started and we were kids, we didn't understand how serious it, it was. So as you, as, as you mentioned, you shared cellars and, and, and uh, places where you wanted to hide. For us kids, it was uh, amazing because, uh, uh, first of all, you had o an opportunity to sleep with your friends, all ten of you, in one room, in one bed. Uh, we didn't understand uh, uh, that, uh, that, that we were hiding. We were actually asking our parents, can we go to the shelter, please? Because it's, uh, it was an uh, opportunity for us to, to be uh, together. But when uh, my parents uh, put my sister and me in the bus to go to, to Croatia, uh, and without them, because before that we, we used to go to, to the sea coast together, and now we are going alone, uh, it was a really... Uh, I mean, I still didn't un understand, but uh, I, I wondered why didn't they come as well. So after a few months, uh, the war, uh, at least its first part, started to, to end, so we returned to, to Mostar, and everything uh, went well. I started to go to school, uh, starting to, to, to go out and, and, and other, other, other things. And one night, uh, my friend had a birthday, uh, and he lived uh, on the other side of the city. And uh, I told my parents, okay, I'm, I'm going to stay there overnight and then return tomorrow, because I have a school and I, ha I have to uh, r return. However, that night, on, my na on the night, uh, 9 uh, May, uh, the clashes between two armies started and it was impossible to cross the, the river. The bridges were, were, were torn, torn down. So basically, I, I stayed there with the, with the family friends, and my parents were on the other side. Now, uh, next month, in, in the next month, I changed several places, several apartments, going from one family friend to another, trying to find uh, a, a way to be transferred to the east side. However, it was impossible. I don't know why, maybe it was God, it was fate, it was uh, something uh, higher force, but uh, during those times, an army uh, forced uh, people uh, who were, well, in this case, Croatian army forced uh, Muslims to, to leave those apartments and go to the east side. However, they always managed to avoid the apartment that I was there. For me, it, it would be probably uh, easy to, uh, to, to be forced to leave that apartment because I would be with my parents sooner. However, in that uh, month, I changed like three or four apartments and they never uh, chose that apartment to, to, to make people to, to leave it. Why, why was that? Why other Muslims were in a uh, more difficult situation? Why, why were you spared? I don't know actually the reason. Uh, maybe because uh, the surname of the, on, the, on the front door it was debatable. It was not easy uh, to, to, to say if it was Muslim uh, surname or, or Orthodox or Catholic surname. So maybe that uh, was. Or maybe uh, because they were all people who knew each other. And in, uh, you are friends today, but in, in a second moment you, you are on the opposite side. So maybe the soldiers didn't want to, to hurt their friends, so they just av av avoided those uh, places. Because uh, it is uh, very important to stay human even during uh, those war, uh, war um, times. So after a month, I moved to. Uh, they they transferred me to a, a small city next next to Mostar, which didn't have war uh, events like shelling and b bombing, but uh, 
me as a, as a Muslim, uh, I was a minority in that city. And I lived there with my grandparents, who also fled earlier uh, from, that, from Mostar to, to that place. And for one year, I lived there with them. We didn't know, uh, those were my ma mother's uh, parents. So we didn't know about my parents, nor what, what happened. The only news that we uh, received were from the Croatian television. And uh, media often gave one perspective. So we had only the ones that were served to, to, to Croatia. And after nine or ten months, we established a communication through International Red Cross uh, me messages and communications. And uh, after almost one year, uh, my parents uh, made an arrangement uh, with the Bosnian army and the Croatian army to get me from Ljubuški to, to Mostar. It was one of the rare opportunities that two sides who were enemies cooperated together to bring me uh, 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 and, and join me with, with my parents. And uh, at that uh, point, uh, I realized that uh, even, even if, if, if we were in the war and you knew, knew who, who were, uh, your em enemies were, it is not okay to judge whole nation based on the act of in individuals, especially during a war. So I, I got back with my parents, and uh, uh, war still continued, because that happened in 1994, and the war ended in 1995. So I still experienced it, the, the hiding, the, the electricity loss, the water loss, and, and everything. And were you lucky in the sense, like Tom mentioned, that about 50% of the children of Sarajevo had seen other people being killed? Um, had, have you ever been... Um, close by when, when fighting happened and, and when people got injured or I was killed? away. I, I was away from Mostar probably at the time when the worst happened. Uh, I, I, I saw dead bodies, but uh, I didn't... Uh, I, I, I wasn't uh, a person who, who someone lost during a war, so that I saw someone of, of mine dead. I know that... Um, uh, Mostar is a sunny city, so snow rarely, uh, it, it's uh, rarely snowing. And uh, I know that my mother told me that uh, after one week being in the shelter, uh, some kind of an, an, an agreement, peaceful agreement, was uh, established for people to go out and, and, and to, to do stuff. And it was snowing in Mostar, so it was unusual. And she told me that uh, my sister and, and other other friends, uh, children, went out just to play with the snow. And suddenly they just heard some noise, and that's it. So they didn't know what, what, uh, what happened. It was like someone just dropped something on the, on the floor. And uh, what, what was it? It was a grenade which, which, which fell close to them. But luckily it didn't explode. It was just uh, in, the, in the ground. So I see that as, a, as a my way of, of being ab absent from the war. Probably the, the, the events of the war and everything stopped me to be, uh, to be in, the, in, the, in the center of M Mostar during, during that uh, hard time, because maybe my fate was to be uh, somewhere else and not in the Mostar. Maybe my fate would be different. Maybe I wouldn't uh, stand, uh, sit here if, if and I if you stayed. look at the friends, uh, your friends at that time, or people of the same age you see nowadays, once you talk about it, uh, some have had worse experience than you. They were unlucky, almost, probably. Yes, someone, uh, someone lost uh, mother, father, both parents, yeah. a member of their family, and it's, um, it's a very uh, hard time for them. But uh, time definitely heals. Not in the meaning that, that, that someone forgets or, or forgives for what happens, but not to focus on, 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 on hatred and revenge, but to focus more on, on, to, on to future. Especially if they establish their own families, then they are focused on them. And uh, we are still talking about, about war, but um, our country and our, our people from our country, they always... Um, uh, say it, uh, they always try to add a joke 
uh, about the war, that it, it used to be better uh, during a war, that a TV show will, will last longer, that the war, uh, TV show will last longer than a, than a, than a war. Uh, so it's a, it's a, they always try to make uh, humor, but uh, what we don't realize is that humor is actually what, what saved us for, from going insane. What's interesting about Tom, Tom showing the picture and going back to people he had seen some 20 years back and now is how many seem to have made it in one way or another. They found a way to study, they may have finished school, they could escape. Um, there are The woman that you saw, she didn't like the picture, but she made it to Australia. And I was listening to you, what you when you reconnected, and listening to you, I wonder how much trauma is left, how much is there still that you don't overcome so easily, or how many people have sort of left it behind and, and, and carry on with the life more or less normally. What would the both of you say from your different perspectives? For me, I think, you know, the agreement stopped the shelling and everything, but it also stopped the, the place moving on. Um, and I found that a lot of the young people were quite dispirited, um, that they didn't see much of a future uh, there, and a lot of them were thinking about leaving or trying to leave. Um, and there are still tensions under the surface. Um, but of course, you, you know, you live there. You, you, you're with young people all of the time. I mean, you tell us, how, do they, do they feel hopeful? Do they? I mean, they're all they're getting good educations, and but do, what, what do they see as their future? Uh, you have to under, understand one thing: that uh, children of the war at that time are grown-ups uh, today. And uh, uh, they, we managed to, to, to finish our schools, to, 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 to have families, to, to start working and everything. So we focused more on other, other, other things. Uh, but uh, also during a war, it is usually left behind. Uh, media, at least media didn't uh, cover it, is that uh, uh, even dur dur during a war, we, 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 we went to school. Uh, we we had to learn, and you know, under with, with the candles and and having shelling, we have to learn songs for the for the exam tomorrow, or we we will get a bad grade or something like that. So we continued those normal things during the war, uh, uh, just to have something to focus uh, after after when when it's uh, all over. I mean, it's it's hard for some people. There are several cases who. Who, who have a post-war trauma, uh, but uh, I mean, when you when you when you come to 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 Sarajevo, to Mostar, to to any of the cities in Bosnia Herzegovina who suffered the war, you unless you start talking deep and deep about it, uh, you 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 will not see any difference than from the people who are sitting here or, or in in Germany. People tend not to talk about war, not not because. Uh, they, they, they want to forget it, but uh, it's because people who are asking about the war, they ask deeply, they, they want to understand, but you will never be able to un understand. It's, a, it's a just a, a, a thing, not that I'm proud, that I know more than, than you. I, I remember during those future lab meetings that we had, one of, the, one of my colleagues said, I wish I was in the in in the war during uh, as I was a child because I would probably learn how to appreciate things more. And then I said uh, to him, "I wish I I could change uh, trade for your childhood in a minute, because I really wanted to know that that period from 10 until 12 or, or, or 13, what would it like without being hidden or without being uh, uh, afraid for for your future or asking where your parents or, and and stuff like that." So it's uh, very debatable. And then when you hear about the woman in Australia now who says, as she has said to you, and you mentioned this, uh, somehow I don't like the picture, but I understand why they have been, why, why they have been shown. I'd rather be stronger and not, not crying the very moment as much as it was typical for the situation. As you imagined, she would leave her child and take it to somebody taking it to safety. If, if you see these reactions nowadays, so many years later, is that a normal reaction? People appear weak and don't want to appear weak, or, or is that...? I think that people didn't want to appear weak. 
I mean, it's, it's a good message with this picture and uh, everything, but even uh, you probably noticed uh, that, that people, even during the war, they wanted to pose. Uh, there were a lot of photographers who, who came, and I know in, in, in Mostar, there a, lo a lot of TV stations came, and uh, they wanted to, to talk uh, with us. And they were, we were all trying to, to look like nice and, and, and to be strong, not to cry. And uh, children who lost someone, during the war, they 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 spoke as as they spoke uh, as, as they speak uh, about about the weather, no 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 tear, no nothing, because it it became very normal uh, to us. So I can un understand that uh, woman. If 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 you probably if she knew that you took a photo at that moment, she would probably say, okay, take take another, brush her her tears, and then yeah, try okay. to. This one didn't. Tom, no, she was, so it's Tom, uh, Tom uh, sorry, um, Tommy, I think you've said at some point somewhere that this picture may be the most important picture you've ever taken, if I remember it correctly. I think, well, I, you know, I think it's one of the pictures that I'm most proud of. I, you know, that's such a long career. You, you know, you don't shoot many pictures that... Um, what, what I like about the image is that so long after it, people still want to see it. Magazines still want to see it. it, it um, I, I told you we had a call from Angelina Jolie saying she wanted the picture to put on her editing suite when she was editing um, Land of Blood and Honey recently. I, you know, my business is making pictures that, make, that move people. I don't want to shock people. I want to move them. The most important thing about today is that um, I'm looking around the audience and there are people who've seen probably far more war than we have. And um, it, it, it's just totally reminding everyone about, about what we have to do to stop the thing happening again or to try and stop what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, yeah, this is an old conflict, and then, you know, people are still talking about Vietnam, the Second World War. People of your generation and the people, your, your students and people that are communicating is about how do we stop it going further? We, we're, we can look back at the past and look at pictures, and you're right, they, um, the, the photography is one thing, but if we could find a way to to make the politicians try and think twice before they embark on such dangerous uh, things, you know, then that's the only thing we can hope for. Yeah, people usually say, oh, give the knives to the politicians, so let them sort it out and don't drag uh, innocent people into it. Uh, I'm, I'm trying, uh, actually, through all these talks, when I have a, an opportunity to, to speak with the, with the foreigners, just to rain, uh, raise an uh, awareness. Uh, what happened 20 years ago in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina happens today in Syria, in Ukraine, in all these uh, countries. I mean, the, I can't probably be more specific in, the, in, the, in, the, in the a politic way, but I know how they are citizens feeling, how they are hiding and, 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 and suffering. And uh, it is important to talk about this, to, to give this, this kind of, of, of uh, picture uh, about it, because media, media uh, can influence a lot. Uh, media can start the wars and, and end the, the wars, as, uh, wars as well. It's actually, it actually uh, helped to start a war in, uh, in ex-Yugoslavia, because um, uh, thanks today, we have so many channels, uh, channels, and we are we managed to uh, watch uh, channels from Serbia, from Montenegro, from Croatia. I remember the the program from from Croatian TV, and I managed to find a, a channel which broadcasted a news from 20 years ago. So basically, they they it, it was a time during, during a war, and it was a Serbian channel. And uh, the way that they were talking about the war and, and, and presenting what, what happened in Bosnia-Herzegovina, if I didn't know anything, I would probably think that it's, it's, it's true that, uh, for instance, mu Muslims really want to kill all the Serbs or Orthodox or stuff like that. And a uh, few years ago, a uh, public service, uh, bro broadcasting service of Serbia made official apology for all the broadcasting that they did in the, in the 1990s. So that, uh, that uh, got me thinking that uh, media, medias are very important. 
At 20 years ago, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have in Instagram, we didn't, uh, we weren't uh, only two clicks away from the from the world to to know what is happening. But uh, it is just because it happened 20 years ago doesn't mean that it won't happen again. Balkan is a windy uh, area. They always say uh, that uh, every 50 uh, years there, there's a war. Every generation talks about uh, war. Next, next generation. I listened about Second World War from my grandfather as my father, and uh, now I'm in a position to talk about the war. Hopefully. My child, when uh, he won't be in that position to talk about new war. Adnan, there is one picture, the one, the Sophia Lorraine, we, we described it, the one uh, that you've come across in Sarajevo. That has a special meaning in Sarajevo, where you live now. Maybe you want to tell yes, us about uh, it. Yes, uh, her name is Meliha Varashanovic, and uh, she got famous because of that picture. Uh, every uh, 6th of April, it's uh, Sarajevo's birthday, uh, birthday of the, of the city, which is also liberation from the uh, Second World War. And uh, uh, she is often invited, because of that picture, to talk about time when you did the photograph and, 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 and about the war and uh, everything, because also at the same time, uh, uh, because Bosnia-Herzegovina got its independent by referendum in, on March 1st, and one month later, which actually is around 6th of April, uh, started the riots and, and first victims uh, were, were, were there. And uh, she, she is still that uh, elegant, that uh, talks about war, talks uh, about it uh, like nothing has uh, changed. And uh, we usually say that she became a brand of, of, of Bosnia and, and Herzegovina. People collect pictures of Marilyn Monroe, Audrey Hepburn, and stuff like that. Now they are, have their, her pictures up on the on the on the walls of their houses, coffee houses, and it's a, she's very famous, but in a in a in a good way. I'm pleased about that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna. I thought I was gonna end up. Like, all I did was push the button. You know, it's like. Um, yeah, but it's uh, it it started to. I I, I, I want to take issue on about the media thing though, because we get blamed for everything. The media you talk. What I'm, I just wanted to make the point that we're talking independent media. That's why it's so important. Propaganda and media has always been a weapon of war, and that's um, you know why it's so important to have uh, impartial reporting. I mean, social media is one thing, but you're just going to have you know everyone shouting about what their point of view is and uh, working with social media and through the middle has to be good quality journalism that you trust, you know? Um, and I think that's, I think that's, that is incredibly important and that's why photographers, reporters, cameramen, brave correspondents right. from magazines have to continue to go to these areas, mm -hmm. even though their editors will say, there's no point going and we can't afford to send you and think of the insurance and all of the excuses even people, even our own editors use, there's no point going, we've got people that you just have to go and see for yourself. Yeah. I didn't uh, blame media, but you have to understand that during that time when we had electricity, uh, at that time in Bosnia Herzegovina, you had three medias giving three versions of, I, that's of the what same I said. story. The Propaganda truth, yes. is... So three yeah. versions of, of truth or, 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 or lie, so you had to, you only had one uh, one uh, way of, of, of looking. Meine Damen und Herren, der eine oder andere von Ihnen hat möglicherweise eine Frage oder einen Kommentar und möchte sich gerne melden. Und wir haben gedacht, dass es jetzt die Chance wäre, Fragen zu stellen, Kommentare abzugeben, was auch immer Sie möchten. Also ich, ich, melden Sie sich bitte und wir, wir würden uns freuen, wenn Sie sich beteiligen. Und in, in Deutsch, in Englisch, wie auch immer. Ich sehe da eine Ja, schönen guten Abend, mein Name ist äh, Bernd Siemens. Äh, meine Frau und ich arbeiten auch als Fotografen in Sarajevo, auch an verschiedenen Projekten. Wir sind sehr häufig dort, sprechen dort sehr oft mit den Menschen. Unser Eindruck ist, dass die, Bosnisch, die Menschen in Bosnien, dass die Menschen in Sarajevo sich von Europa vergessen und vernachlässigt fühlen. Erst recht, und das möchte ich so deutlich sagen, das muss man vielleicht heute Abend auch erwähnen, ein Staat wie Serbien ist verantwortlich 
für eine vierjährige Belagerung einer Stadt wie Sarajevo. Europa, Westeuropa hat lange zugesehen. Ein Staat wie Serbien ist verantwortlich für einen Massaker von Srebrenica, ist aber EU-Mitgliedsbeitragskandidat. Beitrittskandidat, Entschuldigung. Und das empfinden viele Menschen, besonders in Sarajevo, ja, als große Ungerechtigkeit, die sie in ihrem Leben erfahren haben. Es recht nach dieser vierjährigen Belagerung und nach den vielen Toten und Verletzten. Dankeschön. Danke. Adnan, would you like to say something? Uh, I can uh, maybe give an, an, an example. Uh, for instance, you live in an apartment and watching the news and then you feel a smoke and you find out that your next door uh, apartment is, is on fire. So, we, so you will get up, try to, to call uh, firefighters, uh, try to help uh, to, 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 to cover the fire and, and everything. And imagine another uh, scenario where you on the, on the, on the, on the news uh, hear that some apartment is burning outside of the, of the city. You can't do anything. You can just say, oh, poor guys, hope, hopefully no one will die. That's the, probably the example how we felt during the 1990s. Uh, when, when country is, is, is close, in, in this case to European, uh, at that time, U European co community, uh, they will act fast, they will organize, they will do anything what they can to stop it. But at that time, I think even Austria wasn't in, in European community. So uh, it, 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 it was far away. So what, what for us, when you ask any, any, any people from Bosnia-Herzegovina, what would they say is that they, we were far away from them. At that way, Balkans wasn't part of, 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 of Europe. And uh, that's why we, we felt forgotten regarding that. Uh, regarding the, the, the status uh, uh, of uh, awarding Serbia with a candidacy for European Union and Bosnia-Herzegovina having all these difficulties, that's more political uh, 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 thing, which I don't want to uh, comment okay. more. <laughs> Wenn ich es richtig gesehen habe, da, genau, da drüben, bitte schön. Jürgen Behm aus Hamburg. Bei uns haben nach dem Krieg zweieinhalb Jahre eine Familie aus Bosnien als Bürgerkriegsflüchtlinge gelebt. Deshalb haben wir eine sehr enge Beziehung dorthin. Und wenn ich an die Zukunft denke, ist das eine, dass in Sarajevo die Leute sich verlassen fühlen. Die andere ist die, dass die alte Nomenklatur in Bosnien-Herzegowina nach wie vor das Sagen hat und diesen Staat total im Griff hat. Die jungen Leute wollen nur noch weg, wenn es irgendwie geht. Nur, sie stellen fest, wenn sie im Süden bleiben, Italien, Spanien, das sieht, was die Jugendarbeitslosigkeit betrifft, kaum besser aus. Wie dieser Staat in den Griff geht, die herrschende Nomenklatura hat die öffentlichen Einrichtungen voll im Griff. Ein Klinikleiter einer größten Stadt in Bosnien ist der Dritte innerhalb von drei Jahren, der aufgegeben hat, weil er sein Personal aufblähen musste, um den Ansprüchen der Parteien gerecht zu werden. Die Korruption ist ohne Ende in Bosnien, man glaubt es nicht. Es kommt kein Brief ungeöffnet bei uns an. Umgekehrt ist es genauso, also Briefe können wir vergessen, das machen wir lieber mit dem Bus. Die fahren nämlich, die sind zuverlässig, wo bringen wir die Sachen hin und dann werden die abgegeben. Ich kann nur sagen, so kann es nicht weitergehen in Bosnien-Herzegowina. Die Serben, die Herrschenden dort in der Partei sagen zu Serbien, die Kroaten, die Herrschenden wollen zu Kroatien. Und äh, der jetzt herrschende bosnische Mann da, der da was zu sagen hat, der will ein bisschen zur Türkei und Erdogan wird mit großen Pomp empfangen. Und ja, ich, es ist einfach nur noch verheerend. Ich würde gerne das aufgreifen, Adnan. Ähm, ist die Enttäuschung so groß? Ist mit, mit der politischen Klasse des Landes und ist es wirklich so, dass so viele Leute aus Mangel an Perspektive oder aus Enttäuschung über die letzten 20 Jahre am liebsten ihre Sachen packen würden und wohin gehen würden? Sehen Sie das genauso? Uh, well, my father you used to say in 1995, uh, uh, well, so I, I'll rephrase that, uh, he, he, now he, he says, I felt more in 1995 when I thought that 2005 or 2015 would be better. Uh, and now when I see that nothing ha has changed, 
uh, I don't uh, I don't know what to what to do, what to expect uh, uh, more. Uh, for, first of all, there is no words of gratitude for all the countries who accept uh, people of Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially Germany, uh, during that time. Uh, uh, during a war time when, when no one know where to go, what to do, Germany was one of the of the countries who who opened door and accepted us. So it became one of the country with the highest number of uh, diaspora. Uh, regarding the the situation, I work as a, uh, one of the coordinators of uh, Erasmus program, uh, which which involves uh, mobility of, of of students to go to other other universities across uh, uh, Europe and of, of, of course to, to accept others. Uh, we usually say that your generation and my generation in Bosnia and Herzegovina probably will not see prosperity because we have the same politicians uh, that were before the war, during, during the war, on the, on the stage uh, today. And until the, the new generation of, uh, of people comes, even if it's the same political party, just, just new, new, new people, we cannot see any prosperity regarding that. Uh, programs that I uh, coordinate, like Erasmus and other international programs, should be used for our people to go abroad, for, for in this case, for, for study purposes, uh, to see how it is done in other, other countries, whether if, if they're going for the political science, economic science, or, 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 or just to see how, how traffic is or, or organized uh, better. I think it's, it's, uh, it is important to have a lot of people to leave our country and to re return quickly to absorb what West has to offer, because uh, also East, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things in the East that, that are better than on the, on the West. And uh, it takes so much, uh, it, it takes so little for us to, to be more improved, to be more, uh, but I don't think uh, that they still see it. So that's why they need to, 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 to leave the country, not for, for, a, for, a, uh, for a long time, but uh, just, to see that, uh, just to see this new perspective. Because with the, today's perspective, uh, staying only in a, in, a, in, a, in a country is like staying in, a, in, in one room, not seeing nothing above it. Tom, Sie sind nach vielen Jahren wieder zurückgegangen, um sich die Situation in Sarajevo anzusehen. Haben Sie auch den Eindruck, es, hat sich, es tut sich nichts und eigentlich geht alles den Bach runter? Oder haben Sie den Eindruck, es gibt Ansätze, die zumindest Grund sind, vorsichtig hoffnungsvoll zu sein? Well, I, I'm always optimistic because I, I'm optimistic about people generally. As I say, it's some of the things that we've seen, um, you think it, it's never going to recover. And that's not true. I think you're right, it's going to take a, a long time. And I think that, but it's got to come from within. It's got to come from the young people um, who, who rebuild and hopefully see the folly of what that went before with the generation before. I, I found it, uh, it was fantastic to see the people being educated and um, they, were, they were sucking in as much education as possible. They wanted to, um, I, when the conflict ended, um, my translator who worked with me for four years, um, we managed to get her a, um, a scholarship at Cambridge. And so she came out, she went to Cambridge on a, a short course, but it transformed her life because she was able to go back and not just get a, a good job to feed her family, but because she'd come out and had seen mm -hmm. um, Bosnia from the outside, she was much better equipped to think positively about the future. So I agree t totally with what you're saying. If I may add, just, sure. uh, just because uh, all these uh, uh, negative stories are present here now about the living uh, un unemployment and, 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 and stuff like that. Doesn't mean that uh, Sarajevo, Mostarol, or Bo whole Bosnia Herzegovina is bad for living. Uh, people are very happy to be alive at first and that they live on that special area which is Bosnia and, and, and Herzegovina. However, politics is still influencing uh, too much on, on the behavior of, 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 the, of the people. People still look at the politics and, and uh, st uh, still 
think uh, how should I uh, uh, behave regarding what someone said. So uh, it, Sarajevo is a metropolis. It's a, it's, a, it's a great city, capital city, so you have every, everything there, and there's no difference between other cities in, 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 in Europe. However, when we probably become a part of European Union, then we can say that we accomplished something. There is a, there gibt's eine Frage da hinten und dann hier vorne die Dame, bitte. Also ich habe zwei Sachen zu sagen. Erstmal Dobrovetsche. Ich komme aus Bosnien selbst. Ähm, ich habe nämlich zwei Sachen zu sagen. Gerade im Thema Medien. Ähm, ich bin immer noch der Meinung, äh, obwohl ich das aus der Ferne äh, beurteilen, nur beurteilen kann, ich bin regelmäßig in meinem Heimatland, äh, dass es immer noch Propaganda, dass da immer, immer noch Propaganda herrscht dass immer noch äh, fälschlicherweise, gerade wenn ich äh, den neben Niabas verfolge, dass da immer noch Artikel drin sind, äh, wo ich selbst denke, muss das jetzt sein? Und ich muss ehrlich sagen, es hat mich sehr traurig geschimmt. Ich war letztes Jahr um diese Zeit ungefähr in der bosnischen Moschee hier in Hamburg und wir haben Spenden gesammelt. Ich weiß nicht, wie viele von Ihnen davon gehört haben. Letztes Jahr um diese Zeit gab es in Bosnien, in Zentralbosnien, eine riesengroße Flut, die ähm, seit mehreren hundert Jahren nicht so passiert ist in Bosnien. Und in den deutschen, so wie auch in den anderen Medien, wurde nichts davon berichtet und wenn, dann nur kurz. Die Spenden kamen größtenteils von bosnischen, viele größtenteils auch bosniakischen Leuten. Ähm, selbst die äh, orthodoxe Kirche hier in Hamburg hat gespendet. Hier im Ausland können wir zusammenhalten, aber in Bosnien selbst wurden diese Sachen, diese Spenden wurden weiterverkauft, wurden wiederverkauft und die Städte unter sich, die verschiedene Religio Religionen haben, haben sogar gewisse Wasserversorgung etc. gekappt, so wie ich das gehört habe. Aber ich würde mich freuen, wenn Herr Rahimic dazu was sagen könnte, weil das sind jetzt so die Informationen, die ich habe, die, ähm, ja, wo ich gehört habe, es hat mich sehr traurig gestimmt, dass in Bosnien selbst die Trennung noch ziemlich präsent ist. Sie hatten noch eine zweite, wenn Sie die auch noch stellen wollen. Ja, ähm, gerade das hat eigentlich eine kleine Verbindung. Ich weiß jetzt nicht, ob Herr Rahimic von dem jungen Mann gehört hatte. Gerade aus Mostar ist der junge Mann, der ist von der anderen Seite von der Brücke. Und äh, der junge Mann äh, hat es, äh, war auf den Social-Media-Seiten, ging wirklich äh, monatelang umher. Äh, er erzählte, dass äh, muslimische äh, Bosnier ein anderes Aussehen hätten. Und dass man, also es war eigentlich eher humoristisch dann aufgezogen, aber ich finde es schon traurig, dass äh, da wirklich diese Verbindung, das hat eigentlich mit dieser Trennung zu tun, äh, dass die Verbindung trotz 20 Jahren, äh, da, dass da nicht diese Entwicklung stattgefunden hat. Also vielleicht, äh, weil ich bin halt ein aus der Diaspora. Ich kann das nicht wirklich beurteilen, aber ich würde gerne noch so einen näheren Einblick bekommen. Okay. Äh, deine erste Frage. Äh, äh, sadly, sadly uh, that was one uh, regarding the floods and, and uh, humanitarian uh, stuff being sold. That's sadly one of the, of the, of the negative, that we are not, negative uh, activities that we are not proud of. But that, that's only one one uh, things that uh, we couldn't influence people who who accepted that we couldn't uh, co coordinate and, and and influence them that that it should be given to someone who who, who is needed but uh, you forgot that uh, a lot of people uh, forgot all these invisible borders between two entities of bosnia and herzegovina and went to other cities to help cleaning so from Sarajevo, from, from Osta, from other cities from the south where the floods didn't happen that much, they went all, all to, to north and, and helped cleaning the, the city. They didn't mind uh, who was Orthodox, who was, well, in this point, who was Serb, who was uh, Croat, who was uh, Bosniak. Uh, so those, th those stories are also valuable to mention. However, they didn't find its place on the, on the, on the media. Uh, as much as the as a negative story as you as you mentioned uh, regarding the the boy ante from uh, from mostar uh, that's also uh, a propaganda uh, i mean the free europe i think it it it, it was a, a show from uh, the radio broadcasting uh, free europe uh, who 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 wanted to show a story about mostar because even 20 year, 20 years after Mostar is seems, still seems uh, divided. For me, it's not. For me, it is a unique city. I go 
both sides, normally the border is um, erased because uh, as they rebuilt buildings, they uh, erased the border, so you can't see the traces of the, of the war anymore. And uh, that, uh, that uh, kid was, I think, he, he's 15, 16, so he's, he's not even part of the generation who was in the, in the, in, in the war. So what he said was the, the story of, of, of his uh, surroundings. It is true that a lot of people haven't been on the old bridge, which is a symbol of, of, of Mostar and, and how Mostar got its name. Uh, just because they were afraid that, 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 that something would happen to him. However, people started to judge before the second episode was, was broadcasted, where he finally went to the old, old, old bridge and, and, and saw that Muslims are <laughs> same color and, 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 and same, uh, 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 same look as, as, the, as the others. So that's also, sometimes media play with the people trying to, 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 uh, to see what, how, they will, how will they react on, on some things. But uh, what is important not to forget that this, that this is just a broadcasting propaganda and that uh, the life is something uh, else. Hier ist noch eine Frage, aber ich will Sie darauf aufmerksam machen, die Möglichkeit, ein bisschen weiterzureden anschließend und auch noch eine Kleinigkeit zu knabbern und zu trinken, für die, die es nicht wissen sollten, gibt es auch noch. Aber ich, wenn ich bitte, wenn Sie noch Ihre Frage stellen. Hallo? Um, mein Name ist Samra, ich komme aus Sarajevo und ich will auf Englisch sprechen. Um, I'm still learning German, so I don't feel comfortable to speak fluently. Um, I know Adnan, I'm so glad that I see, see him here. We studied together, actually. And I have to say, uh, two days ago I was on a, a Udrai and I saw the poster and I was like, I'm still imagining things. I imagine that they're bringing Sarajevo to Hamburg. This is not possible. And then I googled that and I've seen Bilde Descrit. Yeah, they're doing that. And then I called her and said, we have to go. So thank you so much for organizing this. And um, it's such a pleasure to meet you and to tell you that you showed my life over there. I was during the war in Sarajevo and you showed my life. My mother is like this lady. Today I told her I'm going over there. She said, you have to, you have to show them that we survived. And when I tell her I have a bad day, you cannot have a bad day. You have to be proud, you have to look good. Oh my God, <laughs> how can you do all of that? And that uh, girl that is running, I was that as well. I remember the story that one day uh, we were going through the sniper zone and my dad told me, run. And if sniper hits you, I'll catch you. And that's crazy. You're sending your child directly to die but you don't have option, you have to cross the street. And you said animals. Well, I have a little story about that as well. When you said animals, um, we, we made out of cans one meal and we were going back by foot from my grandmother and on a oh, train station that was not in use during the war, there was a little kitten and it was hungry. And I said, we have to feed the kitten. And my mom said, but we won't have a food. And then my dad said, no, we have to. And we gave a food to kitten. And 10 days after that, um, it was grenading. And I was with my grandmother. And every 15 meters where we pass, grenade hit. But we survived. And my dad came to pick us. And I said, dad, that kitten saved us. Because that's how you have to believe. And I'm so sad that Adnan didn't show the pictures of Mostar because that city is a city that heals the soul. So if you ever come to visit Sarajevo, you have to go to Mostar. It heals the soul. <laughs> and somebody who survived Mostar, I have to say, has my greatest uh, respect because I survived Sarajevo, but it cannot be compared. We see so many bad things, but nothing like some other people. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Keiner glaubt uns, dass das äh, nicht inszeniert worden ist und dass wir uns nicht genau so aufhören wollten. Besser, besser geht eigentlich gar nicht. Ganz herzlichen, ganz herzlichen Dank dafür. Äh, wie gesagt, wir haben gleich noch die Möglichkeit, weiterzureden. Lassen Sie mich persönlich mit zwei Bemerkungen schließen, wenn ich darf. Das eine ist, es 
bei allen Vernachlässigen, bei allen korrupten Regierungen, bei allem, was es dort geben mag ähm, und bei all den Problemen, über die, mit, um die wir uns als Europäer vielleicht mehr kümmern sollten. Die Tatsache, dass es dort junge Leute wie Adnan gibt, ist, glaube ich, ein Zeichen dafür, dass es Grund zur Hoffnung gibt. Das ist das eine. Und das andere ist, ich habe einen Satz gefunden von Tom zum Thema Fotografie und er hat gesagt, man muss das alles nicht so hochhängen. Das ist Fotografie. Wir sind keine Hirnchirurgen. Ich kann nur sagen, ich glaube, dass kein Hirnchirurg so beeindruckende Bilder machen würde. <lacht> Vielen Dank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Danke. Thank you.